um, for the funding and support. My name is Emily, and here today we have Lauren and Kelsey, and together we make up the Biofeedback Collective. So I just want to acknowledge the land on which we're meeting today, Treaty 6 territory, home to numerous First Nations, including the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dene, Dakota, and the Métis Nation. Biofeedback recognizes the current and long history of colonialism in Canada and our own positionality in different places and spaces within this context. We would like to express gratitude for everyone for attending today and engaging with the community project. Great, so this session will explore visual storytelling from the areas of painting, drawing, and comic books with influences from theater and theater design. Um, everybody should have received our pre-session material. It was sent out today. If not, Audra will take us through it during her presentation, but you will receive a piece of artwork to study. At the beginning of our session, we're asking everyone if they're comfortable to explain the story that they read from this artwork and why. During the session, we will discuss elements in visual storytelling, such as colors and symbolism, gesture and expression, as well as discussing visual storytelling as a means of human communication and connection. Post-session, attendees will receive a story and using knowledge learned from today's session, you are invited to create an illustration of the story. The artworks are optionally shared with the group upon completion. Um, Audra poses two prompts to us today. So keep these in mind as we go through her session. So study a piece of art, write down the story you read from it, and think of a story illustrated in one picture. They kind of play on each other and I'm excited to hear how Audra um, goes deeper into them. Um, so just before we uh, hand it off to Audra, um, we just wanted to provide a little bit of background about her. Um, Audra is an award-winning interdisciplinary artist from Saskatoon. She started drawing when she could pick up a crayon and obtained a BFA in studio art with great distinction from the University of Saskatchewan in 2013. She works in many art spaces, including theater and film design, comics, puppets, painting, sculpture, theater, wearable art, and more. Audra often combines her theater and visual artwork and usually includes mysterious narratives in her work. Her main project currently is a silent graphic novel called Flight 19, in which she uses her knowledge derived from theater, such as gesture and design to convey narrative. It is set in a fantastical steampunk-like world, a favorite genre in Audra's work, as well as fantasy, science fiction, myth, and surrealism. To occasionally get out of the studio, Audra enjoys uh, Taiko, D&D, and video games. Please join me in welcoming Audra. <laughs> Thank you. All righty, so uh, real quick before we start, does everyone have a pencil and paper or something like that? Or an iPad you can draw on? <laughs> we'll, we'll be doing some really quick little drawing exercises uh, throughout the uh, session today as well. Okay. Give you a few seconds to grab something. All right. So uh, some of you may have got this picture already this morning, hopefully. Uh, or you may have seen me post it on social media on my uh, invitations to this. Um, if not, you can look at it right now. Uh, this is a painting uh, that I did, I don't know, maybe 2012, something like that. Um, so I just like to uh, start off with what do you guys read from this and why? I can, I can start. Oh, good. I can start off. Um, so I got this feeling of being like really overwhelmed with everything in going on in one's life. So it's almost like the more things that kind of happen, the more you feel underwater. 
um, even in your own environment. So the person feels like they're, they're sinking, you know, below, below that. So it's not going well. <laughs> that was my sort of interpretation. And I guess I probably read it like that. Maybe my own feelings currently. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyone else? I'm happy. <clears throat> I'm happy to go. Um, it reminded me of something more than I read something into it. So also I'm coming at this with my own, you know, perspective. Um, but sometimes I get sleep paralysis. <laughs> and one of the reoccurring dreams I get when I get sleep paralysis is being underwater, kind of fainting, and then realizing I can breathe underwater. There's no bubbles, though, that come out of my mouth. Like I'm just mm. swimming around which is odd, but yeah, so instantly I kind of, th I am not in a red dress when this happens, but I kind of looked at this piece and thought she no longer needed the bubble. She could kind of breathe without it. Ooh. Okay, I'll go, I'll go next. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have, I just have uh, one screen on here, uh, which I presume is okay. Um, when I looked at this uh, uh, painting today, first I was looking through it saying, what is she trying to say here? And then I walked around the house for a while and, and realized, oh, she's asking for my, my own interpretation, my own story. Mm -hmm. and so the story came and I wrote it down. Um, but I, I was very interested in that shift from what am I supposed to see in there <laughs> and, and what actually... How, how could I use that as a launch pad for my own imagination? Awesome. Uh, did you want to share the story uh, with us? It's Barbara, but I'll share the story. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Barbara. Okay. Yeah. This is all that's left of the studio those artists tried to get going way back when. Someone got a hold of some sick green paint, so all the walls are still sick green. The reverse drop in, in the bucket is still falling from the ceiling. A logo for the name of the collective drops in the bucket. What you'll notice most is the figment of that dipsy girl, the one who painted fairies all the time. And much smaller are two would-be artists who never were. One is still about to get into a coffin the other waiting for something to come to the window, an inspiration, a whack of skills, or maybe a load of hard work. In fact, he has two others watching for him too, one at each end. Each of these has escaped from her own promising career by focusing on his sorry plight. Such a bad habit to lose focus as an artist. Awesome, thank you, Barbara. Um, I can share my interpretation. So I kind of thought about this a little bit differently, more like, um, I guess, like, I was thinking of a story that I could, like, relate to this. And I was thinking about, like, the story would be that it would be that person in the center who bought fish from a fish store. But then when she went to feed the fish, she switched places with the fish. And then she became the fish. But then they became like her keepers. I don't know why my mind went there, but that's like the backstory behind it. I think it's just because like the underwater and like the house and stuff. And I was like, oh, like if it were humans in the fish tank, like their house would just look like their normal house, but just with water on it. And maybe she's getting fed. Like maybe that's what the bubbles are. They're like dropping food down for her. Anyways, that was my interpretation. <laughs> All right, thank you. Is there anyone else or are we good? Okay, I take that as we're done sharing. Uh, so thank you all so much for telling me what you read out of this. Um, it's really fun to hear what people actually see in the work compared to what I think is in the work. Um, so 
this to me when I was painting it is more uh I think of it as the house of the dead and uh the greenish uh figures and robes kind of like the dead the zombies um compared to the vibrant um uh woman who's like splashing down and sinking in but she's uh still in a dancer sort of pose and um still quite alive um so obviously the color palette told you all that it was underwater as well as some of the strokes on the top um it also included in here uh two little paintings uh one which has the flowers with some of the petals dropping um which is sort of a memento mori thing um related to it being house of the dead and the ship in the other uh, little painting inside uh, representative of journey uh, so those are some sort of little things that i think about when i'm doing the painting um, so we are going to go ahead and uh, learn about uh, some of the other things that i sort of consider when doing visual storytelling um, like like the girl said i um i do comics as well and i have a background in theater so um, a lot of my knowledge comes from that but i'm trying to aim it for you guys today more in the sort of painting illustration kind of world. Um, but feel free to ask me questions about the other things too, if you like. Uh, we're gonna be looking at colors and symbolism, uh, gesture and expression, and storytelling as a means of human connection and communication. So to get started here, uh, with colors and symbolism, uh, they can vary across cultures, uh, so be aware that your work may be read differently by some people. Uh, some examples I have of this, um, as you can see in the photos here, uh, for brides and widows, uh, the colors that they don um, change by culture. In our sort of Western world, we've got brides in white for purity and widows in black for mourning. Uh, but out on the other side of the world, in uh, places like India and other uh, Eastern cultures, uh, they put the brides in red because it's a uh, very celebratory color and uh, you know passion and love and that kind of thing and then the widows wear white instead so depending on who's looking at it they may uh, view it differently um the other example just being red as a color as a whole uh, i mentioned that it could be um like passion or love um but in other places like um China, it could be for like luck or communism. So again, there's some cultural differences. Um, I was wondering if anyone else happened to think of any off the top of their head that they are aware of. Nope, that's all right. I've got one um, actually. One just came yeah, to mind. Yeah. That's interesting. It's not necessarily a symbol, but uh, in you know North America, we typically wear our wedding ring on our left hand mm -hmm. my roommate's peruvian and they wear it on their right and so it's just yep. a little a switch you know yeah i think that's uh similar in uh some slavic countries as well my dad had worn his on the right hand as well um i have here on the bottom a couple of links um they're just examples of symbolism in art and also the bottom one is a book on sociology uh, that I'll be referencing a bit um, as we go. So if you're interested in checking those out, um, I suppose you can't click the link, but I can put them in the chat here for you. Copy, paste, so that you can check them out at your leisure. And here we go. So, for colors, uh, individual colors have been given meanings by either like a natural response of how we feel when we look at them, um, or by different cultural traditions. Uh, so here are some commonly accepted color associations. Um, can you all read this or no? Should I try to zoom? It's okay. Yeah. So blue, we've got things like tranquility, cleanliness, freedom, uh, cold, sadness. Uh, red, we have things like love, warmth, romance, 
uh, luck, aggression. Uh, orange is like happiness, creativity, youth. Uh, can also be danger or ruin. Uh, yellow, we've got cheerfulness, uh, optimism, uh, brightness. Also can be things like cowardice or illness or madness. Um, for green, we've got stuff like nature and prosperity and health or uh, envy and poison and corruption. Um, these kind of things for green, I feel like it varies on sort of the the tone. Like, for example, a more acidic green, I feel is more towards the, you know, creepy vibes and maybe poisonous compared to a, a more of a foresty green being more of that um, growth and prosperity. Uh, pink, we've got stuff like uh, romantic, innocent, playful, uh, immature, uh, materialistic. Uh, purple, which is my favorite color, if you haven't noticed, uh, is stuff like luxury, mystery, spirituality, uh, dreams, illusion, uh, deception. Um, I use purple a lot in my palettes as well, personally. Um, one, because it's my favorite color, and also it lends itself to that sort of mystery and magic that I often go for in my work. Um, so it works really well for that. Uh, black, we've got stuff like luxury, uh, sophistication, authority, um, mystery again, uh, but also loneliness, uh, hopelessness, and more sinister. Um, white, we have, again, uh, cleanliness, spirituality, innocence, um, also cold, isolation, emptiness. And gray, we have stuff like strength, timelessness, neutrality, um, also being dull and lifeless. So those are some, you know, regular interpretations of these colors. And, you know, a, a painting can be just plain colors. You don't need the figures in it uh, to evoke these emotions. Um, but we're going to go further by using the colors to tell the stories. Um, so the color palettes, uh, when you combine different colors together, uh, they can convey different things like time of day, location, and mood, like how in the previous painting we all knew it was underwater because it had that color palette. Um, so what do y'all think that these color palettes on the bottom uh, make you feel or represent? Starting with the far left. Small Go. child's bedroom. Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> my head went to circus. I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a playful one. It's got a lot of bright colors, very high saturation. But the next one. Uncertainty. Interesting. Why is that? Well, it looks like they're all trying to be a real color. They're not sure which color they they want to be. It's similar to the next one to it because they're kind of wishy-washy, undecided. Oh, I see. Okay. Any other takes on the second palette? I was getting like beach or something. Yeah. Like vacation. Yeah. Similar. That's the picture that accompanied this. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, third one. I think like airy and like fairy and like a little whimsical. Mm -hmm. I get very like sterile, kind of like hospital <laughs> health vibes. Because mm. it's a little bit drained. Barbara, I see you're lit up. Are you speaking or no? No. Okay, cool. Um, all right, uh, one, two, three, number four. I should have numbered these. <laughs> it looks like fall color. It's like very autumn. It's cool and it's warm at the same time. Mm. I think of the forest. Interesting. And this this palette was actually pulled from underwater, so that's cool that oh, you. Underwater. Um, 
that you've got forest and autumn. I wouldn't have thought of that. Uh, the fifth one. Looks like the palette for car companies. We're only going to give you this many choices. <laughs> Love that graveyard. Mm, yeah, kind of spooky. And uh, last one, number six. Night and day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, this one is like, like a Van Gogh starry night kind of thing with the stars. It depends on like the quantity. You would have less of the yellows and more of the blues, obviously. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, a fun exercise. Um, so once you're done doing, I know, your um, line drawing or however you sketch out your paintings and such, um, just being sort of aware of what palette you're going to use uh, can really help. Um, rather than sort of guessing as you go, if you like preset the vibe, it's, it's quite helpful. Um, here's a couple examples I have of uh, palettes in pictures that I've done. So we've got uh, just the gray and that one's feeling pretty like aged and, and um, desolate compared to the, you know, very bright and cheerful ones with the pinks and oranges. And then we've got here uh, two very similar pictures and you see they have very different energies coming off of them um, based on the colors and the mark making. And uh, one more quick example, this is the exact same picture three times but with different color palettes. And you see how um, the first one, the one in red, uh, it's, it's a much more scary picture in that color palette. You kind of feel like she's coming for you. Uh, the middle one is more neutral. And the third one is uh, a lot less aggressive, kind of like airy fairy again. Uh, so next thing we're gonna get into is symbolism and semiology. Um, so if you have taken some social studies or not social studies, uh, sociology classes, you might've heard the term semiology. Um, I use it kind of interchangeable with uh, symbolism. So in semiotics, there's a sign which is made up of a signifier and a signified. For example, uh, a sign could be the symbol of a heart and the constant of love. Um, or it can be some kind of action, like a man gives a woman a rose. The rose is the signifier, it's the object that is doing the, the action, and love is what is signified by giving the rose. And um, these signs are based on shared code or convention um, that we think that roses stand for love, even though there's nothing that really says that in the nature of a rose, right? Uh, signs and conventions are culturally, sh culturally shared and depend on the shared code. Therefore, sign systems only work between people who share the same code. Uh, so example, BRB, we all know, we're all young enough here, we know that's be right back, but your grandma may not know any internet speak and she'd be like, what? Um, similarly, uh, different languages, sobaka, I know what that means, but unless any of you speak Ukrainian, you probably don't, it's a dog. Or uh, this symbol here. Anyone know what the symbol is? Anyone on the same code? I see a smile. It's uh, from Harry Potter. It's a Deathly Hallows symbol. Otherwise, to anyone else, it's just some random triangle with shapes. Um, some other people who were really into uh, uh, signs or the Victorians, they had like signs for everything. You had flowers can mean different things. Each different flower in a bundle that you give someone can send them a message because they all are aware of the code or their dress codes for different classes or times of day and stuff like that. Uh, so they were really into that and we still do it today with our own clothing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so there is three sort of basic kinds of signs in semiology. The first one is iconic. 
Uh, so those ones are based on resemblance. So ex for example, this sign is a sunshine. It looks like a sunshine. It means a sunshine. So it's really straightforward that way. Or on your computer, you might see there's a picture of a printer, and that's the one you click for when you want to print. So those are iconic signs. Indexical uh, signs are based on indication. So for example, the turn signal on the car, when that's blinking, you know that that person is going to be turning that way. Or if there's a smoke, then you are aware that that means that there's also fire there. So that's what indexical refers to. And symbolic, which is kind of the most fun one, I think, is uh, arbitrary. It's based on context, culture, or convention. So the dollar sign looks nothing like money, but it means money for some reason. Or the pound sign or the yen sign, you know, these all mean the different currencies, even though that's not what currencies look like. Like, is there even a dollar sign on a dollar bill? I don't know. Um, so yeah, when we're reading different signs, um, we've got two different levels of reading them. There's denotation and connotation. So denotation is just the surf surface observation. So looking at this American flag, like, okay, the denotation is there's a blue square with a bunch of white stars in it, and there's red and white stripes going horizontally. That's it. Uh, connotation is what this whole image actually means, um, what it makes you feel, the values and ideas you associate it or feel with it. So uh, in the American flag, like the stars uh, all represent these states, and they can also represent dreams. They're all boxed together in this one space instead of all over the place, so therefore it's unity. Uh, stuff like this. And connotations can vary um, based on individual or cultural levels. So individual is what's uh, from your personal experience and cultural is what's based on the collective code, which is what we rely on in visual storytelling. Um, for example, with a rose, if the first time you saw a rose was at a funeral, you may think of it as sad and you just be like, oh, roses are just sad all the time. But culturally, it, the most of us have accepted that roses mean love, right? So here's a pretty fun example uh, from Marco Melgrati on Instagram. Even without the title Politicians Lies, uh, we can read a lot from this image and kind of come to that conclusion by ourselves, right? So we're looking at this man, he's wearing a suit. So that tells us he's some kind of businessman or politician. He's more well off. He's dressed like this all sharp. He's got a microphone. So we know he's taking, giving a speech. He's got his hand to his chest. Yeah. That gesture makes him seem like he's trying to be sincere. Uh, but the shadow behind him uh, looks like he's got a long nose and the code that we're meant to know is the story of Pinocchio and that, you know, when he's got a long nose, he's lying. So politicians lie. So this is sort of things we can look into when reading it. And for stuff like this, we can do it pretty automatically um, when it's, you know, really clearly laid out like this uh, compared to some other work where um, I like to make things a little more vague so that people can come up with a variety of stories. Um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, so looking more at symbolism, a lot of them tend to be illustrative. Um, so here we've got a row of eight different symbols. So can we just go through quickly, what do these symbols mean? Nobody? Okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. I can start. Uh, we've got a yin yang. Are you looking for the meaning of it? I don't know. 100%. The good and the bad, the bad and the good. <laughs> Balance? I'm not sure. A woman. Mm -hmm. A person in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. What's the C? Copyright. Copyright. The C? Copyright. Yeah, it's a copyright symbol. 
Oh, old fashioned phone. <laughs> Good idea. Recycle. Stop whatever it is you're doing. <laughs> yes. All right, so those are ones that we've all learned. Um, and these ones are pretty illustrative, like, you know, it's a telephone, so you know that there's a telephone there. The recycling thing is sort of symbolic in that, you know, you're making a cycle. Um, whereas some of the other ones, like the uh, copyright, that one's just based on, like, abbreviation. And the no symbol is something that we've just kind of learned of when we cross something out. Um, I also notice I put those ones in color. So what happens when we change the colors? Does that change how you feel about these symbols and how you would interpret them? So this telephone now. Um, the red one now becomes like an emergency phone or something like that. Yep. And then when the light bulb is, is dark instead of bright. A bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> lights out, you know, turn the lights yeah. off. Yeah. Uh, does anything happen when we change the recycle symbol to orange? Or is it about the same? I get confused when I see a different color. I don't know what it means anymore. Mm hmm it feels like you'd be recycling something specific, like cans or like paper or mm -hmm. just like a, a holiday one. Like it's Halloween, like this. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, the no sign in green instead of red. It's a good, bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a little bit confusing when it's green instead of red. You're like, it's yes, but also no. Uh, so yeah, uh, and then on the bottom here, I've got some more sort of abstract symbols. Uh, so uh, what do you read from these squiggly lines with colors? There's like a cliff coming up. Watch out for the cliff. All right. This some kind of an explosion, but I don't know why it's open on each side. Mm, okay. Maybe it's a figure. Like a little kind of celebratory mouse or something. <laughs> David says it's all Avatar The Last Airbender. I was trying really hard to not do that. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, the third one here sort of a dull blue color the swirly thing it's like look out for raindrops i don't know <laughs> all right and the final one the scratchy red one fireworks all right so i wasn't that successful in my symbol making there that i was doing real quick uh, so the first one i was thinking of uh more of like a depression like a, a drop off in mood the second one i was thinking more of uh excitement or or possibly explosion actually with everything going out in orange um the bluish one i felt was more like i was going sort of for uh sadness or isolation being sort of in that pit and the last one as just general anger or violence uh, so that was my try now it's your turn uh, so grab out your, your pencils or your coloring, whatever you have. Uh, we'll not spend too, too long on each of these, so you don't need to create a masterpiece. I'll set a two-minute timer for each. So first one we're going to do is creation. How does timers work? I got it. I figured it out. All right, two minutes and counting.
All righty, time's up on that one. Stop. How do I stop it? Okay, there we go. All right. So let's see what we've got. I can go first. Uh, so I got an orange hammer and a pink paintbrush for creation. Because for me, that is how I create stuff. Okay, I can share mine for creation. Um, okay, so All right. I just drew a pencil drawing and it looks like this because I feel like normally like an idea starts here. So it's like kind of like small and then it really <laughs> snowballs and then you end up on the other side of all of your thoughts and creation. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, I can share. I did. <laughs> oh, where is my camera? Three little leaves. Because <laughs> I think, mm -hmm. you know, planting something, growing something, we've just been talking about it so much as a collective that creation is kind of starting with planting an idea. <laughs> nice. Okay, I'll share. I, uh, I got a book first because that's my art practice is making books. And th then I thought, well, that can't be a symbol. That, so how can I simplify that? And no matter what I did with that image, I still didn't know how to draw a hand with a pen in it. I can share mine. It's quite, quite crude, but um, it's more creation of, of life. So there's a figure with a little baby growing in there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to share or should we move on? All right, let's try loneliness. Two minutes and counting. Ten seconds. Alrighty, time's up. Alrighty, so I ended up with a sad ghost. 
done in gray, of course, because it's very, I don't know, dull. <laughs> I got three, three people, but the other, mm -hmm. you know, one of them is separated, and I just yeah. drew his ears different from the other two. Oh, so yeah. they don't, nice. Because his ear is too high. Mm -hmm. I have someone looking out a window, tearful looking down at all the action and people going out on outside the window. Oh, yeah. Um, I made a more abstract one. It's like um, sort of like when it's like these are like all the things together and then there's just one by itself and it's empty and then all the other ones are full. So that's like the lonely one. Nice. Mine is also, I don't know if, ab yeah, abstract is probably the word. I panicked because <laughs> okay. I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> um, but I've drawn a box and I only have highlighters, so I couldn't get the colors as dark as I wanted, but I wanted like a purple to blue gradient. And then it's in like a really distressed box because I feel like as soon as you're lonely, you also isolate yourself to make yourself more lonely. Mm -hmm. um, mine's sort of similar to Lauren's, but less creative looking. Um, so I have these little figures and then a little one, and then I drew another one where it's a can of beans, but then there's one that's alone. I have one. So there seemed to be a little bit of consensus on that one. There's three of you who had pretty similar ones. Nice. All right. Last one here is community. In two minutes. And I'm just changing some settings on mine. Do, 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 do. I'm just looking at the comments now and seeing that we missed um, Karen that I, what I assumed for creation was a spiral with a leaf growing out. So thanks for sharing that. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Karen. All 
All right. Uh, so for community, I've got this. I've got lots of colors overlapping, making other colors in a circle together. And I tried to keep the colors more sort of vibrant and lively. Great. Who would like to share? I've got mine here. Mm -hmm. So um, a sketch of a circle with, well, with women in it. <laughs> um, I have a question. Is it still a symbol if it's so, uh, with so many lines in it? Or is it a symbol mean, to make a symbol, does it have to be very simple in design? Uh, in this case, I would say it can be as complicated as you like. Um, for example, a lion is a symbol of strength. So you could draw a whole lion and, um, you know, that could mean strength in your picture. Or you could do something really simple and graphic if that's the way that you prefer illustrating. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go next because mine's cheesy and rushed. <laughs> it's hands in a circle. It's community. There you go. Nice. Cheesy is very clear. It's something that we all understand really well. Anyone I else? Drew, uh, I drew like a community hall. Like a hall. Mm. Go and eat. Or do other things. Thanks. I, I tried to make mine like really minimalistic as if we were to see it on a sign somewhere. So mm. don't mind the one that's darker. I just couldn't draw a circle. But it's a number of circles with like little lines connected. This was to represent people holding hands together in a similar vibe. Mm. There mm -hmm. you go. Nice. Um, this is mine, this one, so mm. kind of, yeah, and then I did it in green to represent kind of something that was like alive and growing and changing. Um, okay, I'll show you guys mine. So it's like, um, kind of looks like a flight path actually, but it's supposed to be like um underground like root systems <laughs> but oh. it didn't really come off that way <laughs> right you're only given two minutes <laughs> that's true thanks awesome so that was fun um what's next oh maybe my computer will work hello computer there we go okay so another fun thing um about doing our uh shapes and or sorry our colors and symbolism so uh shapes can give off different uh vibes um and shapes can be used all over in your pictures um in your people in your architecture in the plants in uh your line work anything um so some common uh interpretations, I guess, of uh, the three most basic shapes, uh, circles, squares, and triangles. Uh, circles uh, get soft, gentle, young, approachable, caring, and honest. Uh, squares are read as strong, confident, brash, arrogant, dependable, and trustworthy. And triangles are uh, seen as devious, cunning, roguish, emotional, clever, and elegant. So, for example, you may see in a lot of cartoons, uh, because they really tend to exaggerate this, uh, your villains are probably made of triangles, and your heroes are probably made of squares. Unless they're adorable, then they're circles. <laughs> um, and like I said, these can translate also into the architecture. So on the bottom here, these three buildings all basically the same. They've got a door, two windows, and a roof. Um, but one's made of circles. It looks very welcoming and cozy. One's made of squares. 
It does not look so welcoming and cozy. And the third one made of triangles is a little bit more mysterious. You're not quite sure what's happening there. Um, yeah. Uh, and then these two faces on the bottom uh, made of circles and triangles. Uh, these are the protagonist and antagonist from my comic. Can anyone guess which is which based on the shapes? <laughs> So yeah, the one made of circles is the protagonist and the one made of triangles is the antagonist. And the fun thing about that is I didn't mean to do that. This was just sort of an automatic thing that, you know, we've learned growing up that this is sort of what these shapes um, make us feel. And so just by accident, when I was creating these characters, I happened to make them out of circles and triangles. Uh, the style of your piece and the mark making can make a difference too. Um, so if they're soft or hard, sketchy, airy, um, one of you showed uh, your illustration of a box for loneliness and you deliberately made this sort of sketchy line for the box. So that was an intentional choice. Um, you can see down the side here, these uh, three rainbow haired girls. Uh, they're all the same character, but drawn in different styles. And you can see how it, tra uh, it um, transforms how you're reading the character. Um, and then these landscapes, again, the same landscape twice over. But the first one is very soft. Every, all the gradients are very smooth. All the lines are very smooth. There's no sharp edges anywhere. So it's like kind of nice and peaceful and whatnot. But the bottom one is very more sketchy. The shading is got a lot more lines in it it's harder edges and so it's a uh, not so peaceful it's kind of more mysterious or foreboding and then another thing about style is modality uh, so mo modality is um sort of a, a scale of how realistic it looks and uh, realism tends to us to feel more serious or true uh, compared to cartoonier styles, which may feel more whimsical and lighthearted. And these are considered low modality. So for example, on the bottom, it's figures and everything, but they're very stylized. Whereas uh, the top one, it's uh, pretty photorealistic. And so out of the two of them, you would be more willing to think that you could be in the world of the top one than the bottom one. You don't expect to go outside and find uh, people who are white stick figures with extra long limbs and whatnot and no faces. Um, but you might expect to go out and find, okay, maybe you don't expect to go out and find people in masks, but these are literally my friends. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, to summarize, it's uh, the style that you're illustrating in can affect how your picture is being read. Um, another thing when uh, composing your entire picture, um, and these are things that I've learned from theater design, uh, and they're also relevant in film design. Uh, we've got lighting, so you, there's a difference in if you choose to do a soft lighting from behind, like in the first picture, versus a harsh top light that obscures half the face in shadow, like in the second picture. So the first one is uh, more soft and welcoming, while the one with the darker and sharper shadows is a lot more ominous. Um, you know, both of them have these spiky fingers, but you really don't want to go and talk to the second one, right? <laughs> um, similarly, uh, we've got uh, camera angle, framing, cropping, and focus. So in this um, bottom, uh, the black and white half portraits, um, the cropping of it on the left one is you see the face, it's very clear, everything is um, quite in high contrast, uh, whereas the other one, uh, it's cropped so that, you know, part of the eye isn't even showing, it's in shadow, the hair's covering it, and so that one looks um uh, a lot more you know shy in that sort of one 
And uh, these are actually from the same photo. Um, it's a self-portrait I did in school. And so if you switch them the other way, it's the same photo, um, but the way that it's been cropped, you see it as two very different vibes or two very different people. Um, camera angle, um, low angle suggests power of the subject and um, different angles like that. So in this example in my comic, we're looking up at the antagonist on the balcony and we're looking down at all the crowds. So that shows you that she's the one in power and they're not. And in this uh, bottom one with the scythe, the cropping and framing has our focus on the scythe as the main object, despite the figures in the background who are doing the gestures. And they're both looking with their eyes at the item as well. So those are more choices that you can make when composing your picture. Uh, we've also got costumes and clothing. Uh, so the clothes that we choose to wear act as a sign system to tell others who we think we are. Um, also dress codes and conventions related to social class and occupation and all that kind of stuff. Um, so way back in the day, the Victorians had their whole dress codes to show you, you know, I'm a fancy lass, I'm very rich, or I'm just some peasant or whatever, or I'm a servant, so I'm going to just wear black and blend into the background, right? Uh, but we still do this today. Um, for example, um, because I know him, I know he doesn't mind, David here. Hi, David. David is wearing a uh, dress shirt and rainbow suspenders and rainbow glasses. So he's wearing the dress shirt because he is trying to be professional. That's part of a businessy thing. But he's also showing off that he is very fun. He's very uh, energetic person. So he's got all these rainbows. And you know, this is what he is showing us to the world. Um, compared, for example, to my outfit here, I've got um, this dark purple, which is again, my favorite, I've got sort of these billowy lace sleeves, because I want to be all like, I don't know, romantic or whimsical sort of thing, as opposed to just like a regular t shirt that I might wear on a normal day. Uh, so these are things that I'm telling to you visually about myself of who I want to be. And um, in that uh, previous picture with the people in masks, that's from my BFA show where we did a whole masquerade where people just showed up in whatever costumes they wanted to and whatever masks they wanted to. And it was about capturing who they wanted to present themselves as in that moment. Um, so you can also go ahead and look at yourselves if we were all together and have you look at each other and try to um, decide or, or guess, I suppose, based on your partner's outfit, um, things about them. But as we're not, it's kind of hard to do on the video chat. So we'll just keep that in mind next time you meet someone and just, you know, try to figure out who they are. I mean, we kind of do this automatically anyway, right? If you're going down uh, on the bus or if you're in a cafe, you see someone, you're like, oh, yeah, I make certain judgments on this person based on what they're wearing. So therefore, when we're creating a piece of art, what you put the person in, what you dress them in matters. And I just have some examples of that on the screen here. So we've got two um, basically identical characters in the top left, but they're wearing very different outfits. And those are showing off their two different personalities. It's a split personality character from my friend. Or um, in the bigger picture, we have the one elf lady. So she's wearing very organic green um, dress and there's no like straight edges. It's all kind of I guess deteriorated roughly on the edges compared to the man who's wearing um, like clearly cut clothes and all that kind of thing. He's got these boots, he's got his embroideries, he's got a hat, so he's much more put together. And by um, the style of clothing, as you can also tell, he's, you know, Ukrainian um, descent and um, sort of like a middle class kind of thing. 
So the other thing um, is the props and set, which can help tell the story as well. So here we've got two scientist types both doing their work. Um, but we can see based on what's in their surroundings, um, how their work differs. We've got the woman, she's got a much fancier. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm not used to talking this much. So I'm gonna take water for a second. Alrighty. So yeah, she has a much fancier uh, background. So she's clearly a higher class compared to his uh, dank, dark laboratory. <coughs> and we can also see that they're both doing uh, mechanical and biological related research based on all the eyeballs and screws and whatnot on their desks. So here's another painting I'm going to have you check out. And I've got a close up here as well of part of the details. So what do we see in this picture? I'll give you a minute to look and then just go ahead and shout out whatever you um, are reading. Do we have any observations on who these people are or what they might be doing? Well, I, I'm i uh, fascinated with the uh, woman on the left at the larger image on the right. It seems to me she's got herself so sophisticated and stiff that she can't see anything. Um, I'm curious about the bear at her elbow. Um, oh, and the, there's another figure above that as well. Mm -hmm. I'll let someone else see what they, what they see. Say what they see. I was looking at this like the standing figure was notifying the sitting figure that people had arrived. And maybe because the standing figure's eyes are bandaged, they're more of like a spiritual kind of arrival instead of a physical kind of arrival. Mm -hmm. um, and because there's tea set up on the table behind them, I'm assuming they're going to have a chat over tea. Yes. Um. I sort of thought that that green part in the background behind the curtains was this like kind of portal for this strange figure on the ground. And the only way that the lady, the Victorian lady can like communicate is by like not seeing. Like it's this like lack of sight that initiates a sort of communication between the two figures. And do we feel that this is a, a welcoming scene or not so much? What kind of vibes are we getting off of it? The um, the girl on the, the floor is kind of like interested, like she's got the hand on the chin sort of thing. Um, and then the, the woman standing, um, I wouldn't say that she's like, 
unwelcoming, but there's definitely like the hands crossed in front is not like oh it's not not welcoming with open arms, right? It's it's like slightly reserved, but not completely blocked off like a like a crossed arm would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still get uh, like a cautious anticipation, mostly mostly anticipation, but Oh, Karen, I see it went into the comments. It seems to me like a possible seance setting, particularly with the title. Mm. Very cool. Mm. Yeah, so it is something a little bit spooky. Um, so the, the my choice was to use the purple and acidic green to sort of make it uh, feel mysterious and unsettling. <coughs> um, Barbara had mentioned the, uh, she said bear, it was supposed to be a lion head roaring and the uh, figure reflected in the mirror. So um, lions kind of being either strength or regality and this one's aggressive being a roaring lion. And uh, the figure coming in, um, I've kind of left it up to you guys who is saying they're here, if it's the person walking in who's saying they're here and they found these two women, or that the women have found that the visitor has arrived. <laughs> and then, yeah, you guys read how the one character is um, much more prim and all that whereas the other one is just kind of more chill sitting on the floor uh yes so that was a pretty good read what do i have next here oh yeah so we started talking about this uh you guys were already starting to read their gestures so that's actually our next topic is gesture and expression. So uh, you consider the physicality of the figures in your artwork and how their gestures and expressions can aid in storytelling. On TV and in real life, uh, gestures and expressions tend to be uh, more subtle. Uh, but on stage, which is uh, my background, and in comics and cartoons, which is again my background, um, they're usually more exaggerated. Uh, in your painting and illustration, it's up to you. Uh, but perf personally, I prefer the more dynamic gestures um, because I find them more visually appealing. They're prettier. They're more interesting to look at. And uh, they're less likely to be missed by today's audience because people look at a picture for 10 seconds nowadays. Um, so some examples we've got in the, the left here, you know, she's obviously sad by the sad face the top one she's got surprise she's got her open arms at the bottom in a sort of form of surrender plus uh the prayer sort of thing so she's accepting this uh supposed death as she's being attacked by a scythe wielding mermaid um that's that's the one fun thing in in my comic is it's really annoying to draw uh people with four arms all the time because that's a lot of arms to figure out but it's also really good for doing complicated gestures without words uh because you can do say two things at once <laughs> uh, so facial expressions um we're pretty familiar with we do them all the time my face not as expressive um as some of my friends are <laughs> um but some things to consider is uh the squash and stretch so depending on what um, expression you're going for different parts of the face are going to squash or stretch so for example for the happy face um the mouth i'm going to look ridiculous doing this but the mouth is uh really big right and it's squishing the cheeks here and that's the cheeks are squished in the eyes from below, right? Whereas the sad, it's pulling down that way, it's stretching this way. You can be stretching these um, lower cheek, whatever. I'm not an anatomist. Um, <laughs> or um, 
even more clearly on the angry. Ah, so we're getting this stretch and squish there. It's really squishing in towards the middle. For surprise, everything is way more open and everything is stretching out. Even the eyeballs are stretching out. So here's just some examples of uh, different um, facial expressions. We've got despondency, laughter, hate, indifference, uh, impatience, and coy. Um, and then these last four I don't have labeled, so have a guess. What's uh, this first one beside hate? Sad. Mm-hmm. Anguish, yeah. Anguish, yep. Yeah, I kind of thought despair. Yeah, so she's like a beyond sad, like this woman is hurt. Uh, the man beside her? Suspicious. Mm -hmm. And the other man? <laughs> Confused, yeah. Confused or dumbfounded was the word that we had. And the last one, the baby. Num, 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 num. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, it's more of a, uh, a happy surprise, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, so next we're going to do... Another quick little exercise to do our own facial expressions. Uh, so let's give these three a try. And we'll do two minutes each again. So we've got curious. Forget I was on mute. Uh, that's two minutes. So what I've got here, I've got sort of a slightly parted lips to the side, slightly squinted eyes, and a little bit raised eyebrow. What has everyone else got? Um. Mine is this gentleman 
his eyes are kind of like looking to the side like that emoji mm -hmm. where the eyes are like looking over there that's sort yeah. of what he's going for and the eyebrows are kind of up i can go mine is uh, i when i'm curious about something my one eyebrow goes high and so i tried to mimic my one eyebrow going high oh yeah nice. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I made one with one eyebrow high too. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. It's like um confused, but kind of like skeptical confused. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, if that's everyone who wants to share that one, we'll do the next one. This is a good surprise. And time. Okay, so I've got this happy person. <laughs> uh, so really wide eyes, and I decided to give them star for pupils or whatever. Uh, and just a really huge, slightly open grin. Anyone else like to share? Yeah, I've got mine here. Mm -hmm. I was amazed at how quickly I could put your lesson to use by broadening the, the face out. <laughs> it made him look much more surprised. Nice. Anybody else? I have something similar to yours, except the hands are on the face. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Um, this is mine. I put some teeth in it to try to make it look like happier. <laughs> yes. It's end up being fangs. He's <laughs> a happy vampire. Excellent. Anyone else or the last one? All 
All right, we'll go for the last one, bad surprise. So we'll see how this one differs from good surprise. And time. All right, so here's my bad surprise beside the good surprise. So still really wide eyes, but I've straightened out the bottom uh, of the eyelid. And we've got a small, slightly agape mouth instead. And the eyebrows have also changed from the curve to the sort of other way a bit. I think mine just looks mad now after seeing yours, but I will share. <laughs> That's supposed to be a furrowed brow. Mm -hmm. A little bit more on the angry side. He's, yeah. not, he's not pleased about the surprise. <laughs> Um, I can show mine. Um, mm -hmm. There. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he is shocked. Mm -hmm. I have a, a don't look surprise. And I, I thought, where would the other hand be? Probably at the stomach. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I have one. It's more like um, surprise and then like um, embarrassment or like something. Like you're like, <laughs> oh no, I can't believe this happened. Surprise. <laughs> cool. All right, that was very good. So then we're going to get into our gestures. Um, so like I said, I like to do much bolder gestures that help uh, give the expression of how the person is feeling, um, as opposed to the more subtle ones. So here we've got um, two examples, uh, Ruin and, uh, okay, the second card was called The Void, but he's getting his soul sucked out of him. So um, I went for sort of like a an open but... Uh, more of a pained pose, I suppose. You know, it's not really a, one that you tend to do naturally in an open mouth, uh, whereas Ruin is uh, a lot like crouching down and uh, being broken. 
Uh, some more examples here. We've got uh, Dancer. I love painting dancers. They just have really nice gestures. They're really nice to look at, to be honest. Um, so this one is uh, much more like open and joyful. Um, or this one, again, we saw in the low modality. Um, this one's much more aggressive, I suppose, because um, she's being stabbed by the other guy. So it's got a lot of movement going in the one direction. And uh, I've thrown in a bit of symbolism here as well. The red sort of scarf things uh, being a more pretty version of blood, I suppose, because <laughs> I don't like to get gory. Um, and the hole through his chest and all this kind of stuff. And also the, um, the colors are uh more like acidic again with the the green and the yellow and it's sort of raining down it's very messy so it's uh kind of playing with being a pretty piece at like a glance and then looking at it longer going no this isn't a very pretty scene that we're witnessing here it's more um i guess ugly and um and violent and uh, because this happens to be David's favorite picture, it's the one that's in my living room on the wall over there. I look at it all the time. <laughs> and then here we've got some more gesture examples. So this one's from my comic book. So we've got um, for example, the two girls, two women, um, holding hands so you can see that they're close to each other. The one has a hand up, so she's like sort of thinking. In the bottom left panel, we have a gesture for, you know, strength, while the other one is shaking her hands uh, in disagreement. No, no, I don't want this. And again, the facial expressions are showing one thinks its strength is good, and the other says no, and her face is also saying no at the same time. And uh, in the last panel, uh, again, with the forearms being convenient for saying several things at once, you know, gesturing at the girl and being like, what, I don't understand, and also like the thinking sort of gesture. Um, and then up here we have a uh, closed in uh, gesture um for someone who is you know probably hurt and as you can see with these little uh cartoony guys uh it also works if they're not humans gestures can work on little goofy monster creatures as well uh these are a few of my hooligans which um are little thermal plastic sculptures uh based on negative emotions or mental illnesses <coughs> So the uh, beige one with the hands covering, this one is embarrassment. Uh, anxiety is the one in the middle top that's got uh, the eyes wide open and alert and a very prominent frown. Depression is the one that's um, curled over into a very inward sort of thing. I found that that gesture was based on my own gesture that I always had when uh, dealing with depression. <coughs> and the last one, uh, lethargy on the floor. Just splat. And his nice big ears also going splat. <coughs> uh, here we're combining a few different uh, techniques. So we've got the black background and the sort of skull look on the octopus. <coughs> so these are very sinister and death-like symbols and colors. And then we have the uh, girl Andromaca on the bottom in the red circle. We have the hands coming up to the face in shock and horror. We have the expression on her face, very wide-eyed in horror, and also the background 
pardon me, is uh, red. So a very um, uh, passionate color and it's being like shattered. And in the next page as well, I did the layout so that all of the uh, different boxes were uh, giving a shattered broken glass sort of look. <coughs> because uh, that was her child who was dropped off of the airship. Um, also using the colors um, to sort of depict her emotions along with the gestures. So in the first one, we've got this sort of rage anguish happening. And then the next ones where she's um, dropped down to the ground and sinking into these much more desaturated, darker colors. Then we have um, the uh, the sad face obviously has the blue background. And then the second close up, um, you see that while she's still crying, that her uh, eyebrows have gone in instead of out. So this is turning more into anger and that's also accented by the change to the red background. And for, pardon me, uh, for composition also, in the final panel, we have the two characters who are embracing, but um, I've zoomed out quite a bit to give a um, more of a sense of isolation and loneliness. So those are some examples from my book. So let's try another drawing exercise uh, for trying different gestures. So the first one we'll do is anguish. So we've got our sketchbooks ready. Now I'll turn on our two minutes. So you can choose whether you want to draw the expression on the face or not. Um, I'd say for this exercise, completely cool to just skip it. Show me in the body itself how you're expressing anguish. And time. These quick drawings are getting harder as you're having to draw more things, hey? <coughs> it's okay, stick figures are acceptable. Which is pretty much what I did. So you already saw my anguish in the example on the previous page. This is just a more simplified version. Wow, yes, that's exactly what I did. You just did it much better in a nicer stick figure. That's supposed to be on their knees with their yep. arms in the air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> yeah. I did something similar. It's like um crouched down, like mm. you know, yep. <laughs> yeah. So I think that um the anguish that the three of us did is a little bit more uh 
a little more on the angry side, whereas yours is more on the sad side, which is uh, a good distinguishment as well. All right, let's give a go at excitement. Alrighty, time. So here's what I've got for excitement. I'm basically running about, hands up in the air, and face tilted up. It's a high energy. Okay. And I have a I have a similar one until I put the face in and all of a sudden now she's running in horror. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. Mine's also similar. One leg kicked back because that's excitement. And the same thing, I think. <laughs> oh, nice. Kind of jumping. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mine's kind of similar. It's like supposed to be like if you do it, <laughs> like or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nice. Very fun. All right, last one is anxiety. And two minutes.
and time. So I've got here pretty closed in, sort of a protective with the arms crossed and a bit shaky. I find that when I'm anxious, I uh, just sort of shut down more as far as expression goes. <laughs> uh, but that's just me. Uh, let's see what you guys have got. I also got on cross. Mm -hmm. Mine's kind of similar to when I did anguish, but it's like a person like crouched, like holding themselves in a ball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I use my uh, anguish again with a bit of refinement and, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, to to with the head down and uh, all very protected yeah. yeah with the energy all within mm -hmm. all righty good work everyone um so just so you know that was our last uh, drawing assignment for a during session and we are nearing the end in case anyone was curious uh, so let's carry on uh, so the last bit um, before getting into uh, communication and connection is uh, composition so composition can help you tell the story uh, especially in comic layouts um, but it also works for just single illustrations as well uh, things like the use of sight lines and perspective lines can help uh, guide the viewer's gaze and how figures interact with each other and their surroundings can um, help tell the story as well. So in this top panel here that we've highlighted, we have all the perspective lines um, going back, uh, pointing towards um, this figure in the front of the line. And the fun fact is that the figure in the front of the line is on the last poster as well. So it's pointing to uh, themselves. <laughs> and then, uh, so that's an example of using um, uh, perspective lines. Uh, sight lines um, are more like in this bottom one where you see uh, the woman who's kneeling. She's looking up at the other folks or they're looking at the uh, picture. Um, also, I use sight lines um, and that kind of thing in the comic layouts to help guide the viewer through the page um, because I don't always have as straightforward of a layout. So sometimes you need to have uh, where the character is paying attention sort of guide you onto the next appropriate panel, which you kind of can see here too with the two uh, sad girls on the side. They're both looking towards the next panel as opposed to looking back the other way because then you'd kind of wander off to see what they're looking at and then um, how the figures are interacting with each other in this last panel uh, gives you some idea of uh, their relationships or how they're feeling the one woman she's kneeling down to be closer to the little girl and is putting her hand on her so she's feeling more protective um, there's these other two girls on the left they're holding hands so they are caring about each other in this context and uh, one of them is looking down and uh, having her hand to her heart so she's feeling deeply sad about this whereas the other one is looking up with a, a fist raised so she's very angry about this uh, this kind of thing our last section is storytelling as a means of human connection and communication uh, so stories, whether factual or fictional, have always been uh, one of the primary ways humans communicate and connect with each other. Uh, they may be histories, like records of events or learning from your past, or they can be myths, uh, which can be moral lessons or share universal experiences. Uh, so, for example, in this other comic I do for Maureen Haddock, uh, there are stories about her husband as a kid in the 50s, 
and um, they always end in these little what did you learn things so they're all moral lessons and that's what her storytelling is based around and um, it's what we can use in our visual storytelling as well Uh, stories are often oral or written, uh, but visual stories are as old as like cave paintings. <laughs> There's been drawing for a long, long time. Uh, the advantage to visual storytelling as opposed to text is that they can be read across cultures without a shared oral written language. So even though I'm Ukrainian and you're not, um, I can show you a painting about uh, something from my Ukrainian heritage and you can still read some of it um, without actually being able to read Ukrainian. Uh, the disadvantage is they can be misread more easily than text uh, because of our different interpretations of what something may uh, make us think of or our associations that we personally have. Um, and of course, they vary um, based on culture and experience of the viewer. Uh, the cool thing I find about visual storytelling is that it sparks the storytelling instinct in the audience. So when I give a picture that has some sort of narrative in it, even if I haven't personally completed the narrative, um, the viewer has the opportunity to make a whole story by themselves, uh, independent of whatever I wanted to say or had started saying and trailed off. <laughs> um, and as the artist, uh, you can choose to be more obvious or more ambiguous in your visual storytelling. Um, for example, that one way at the beginning with the Pinocchio nose thing, that was pretty on the nose, pun intended. Um, whereas a lot of my, uh, my, uh, my personal work is I like to leave it more ambiguous and mysterious. Um, so I find that to be a lot more fun that way. And um, questions and discussion before I give you your prompt. Any questions about this whole thing that we've been talking about this whole time or anything you would like to discuss further? I have one question. I don't want to take up too much time because I know we're kind of capping off at our our time for this session, but I just want to know what uh, inspired you to do the uh, purely animated um, booklet and not have any text in it. And I'm just really curious about that. Yeah, so um, it comes from uh, my experience doing the visual, <coughs> you know, the visual fine art and theater. Um, the entire story happened because of a drawing. So I drew a picture first. I drew another few pictures with the same character. And I thought, okay, let's piece this together into a story. So then I wrote a general outline of the story. And pictures were always what started at first, there wasn't like a detailed script or novel. Uh, first, it was all based on pictures. And I was originally going to do the whole thing in paintings. Uh, but then I realized that would be really tedious. So I switched over to marker. Uh, because it's like tiny paintbrushes. <laughs> uh, it has been a bit of a challenge um, to not have words in the book, especially when characters talk to each other, because then they're talking to each other in also pictures. <laughs> um, but it, it's been a pretty fun challenge, and uh, I've enjoyed it, and I look forward to hearing what people read out of what I'm putting down. <laughs> so if there's no more questions, I'll go ahead and give you your homework. You can copy it out or take a screenshot, however you like. Uh, so, she was longing to board the ship, but something kept holding her back. She dreamed of a bright future and an escape from the troubles she'd lived. Time was running out. She needed to find the courage to let go and move on. 
And of course, you can substitute the gender as desired. It doesn't have to be a woman. <laughs> and um, once you're done your picture, uh, send it to biofeedbackcollective at gmail.com and they will share your work with me. And I think you post it on the website. Yeah. If people would like that, yes. Yeah. So um, if you send them, you can say, yes, please share mine or only share mine to Audra or whatever you prefer. Uh, does everyone have that copied or screenshotted? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll uh, I'll send this off to um, to Kelsey, Emily, and Lauren as well, so that they have. <coughs> pardon me, so that they have the text as well in case you missed it. Um, so this has been me, Audra Ballion. I like purple. Uh, that's my website. If you want to see more of my work or my comic book. That's my email if you want to contact me. And if you want to find me on social media, it's Audra Ballion Art. And if you're looking for a studio, I'm looking to find some studio mates for doing stuff. So you know, so you can email me about that too. And uh, thanks so much to uh, the biofeedback folks for having me. It's been super. Thank you, Audra, for leading us today. And just an extra thank you to everybody who came out and attended the session. We're just so grateful for the opportunity to be here together and share and learn from one another. So this has been a really fun Tuesday evening. It's been great. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their night. And thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thank thanks you. So much.